Well, Dr. Jane Goodall is a legendary primatologist and anthropologist and the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and the organization Roots and Shoots. Most recently, she is the author of the new book, The Book of Hope, A Survival Guide for Trying Times, and is a COP26 advocate for the conference in Glasgow this year. Dr. Goodall, welcome to the Climate Pod. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I'm curious, you know, obviously COP26 is just around the corner. What made you want to be a COP26 advocate? Well, it's such an important conference. I mean, our future hangs in the balance. We're at a crossroads, really, with climate change, loss of biodiversity, the pandemic. And one has hopes for this, for this COP26, that the world leaders will actually make good decisions, make good pledges and that there will be some follow-up afterwards so i think anyone who's asked to make a contribution as i have been um should step up to the plate and you know with that world leaders will look to your insight when so when it comes to what world leaders can accomplish at this year's conference what do you hope to see well i want to see them as i've said i want to see them make firm commitments to reducing emissions um, not simply what I think is copping out by buying carbon credits. That's that's for business rather than governments. But, you know, this meeting includes many um, multinationals and businesses from all around the world. And for a business to buy carbon credits, it means that they just hand their pollution on somewhere else. <laughs> it just doesn't seem the right way to move ahead. You know, we've talked a lot on the show about biodiversity loss and what we are changing, what we are seeing with the, the climate crisis and what is happening to biodiversity. How can we act and how can international leaders act to actually preserve biodiversity? Well, that's a very big question because we're losing biodiversity for a whole variety of reasons. The main one being that there's been this absurd idea that we can have unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources, that annual growth of GDP is more important than saving the environment for future generations. And so as uh, companies with the backing of governments are moving into more and more habitats and destroying the habitats, so we are losing biodiversity. And so, you know, we, if we, I, I look at it like this. Um, we are part of the natural world. We depend on it for clean air, water, food, clothing. We depend on it for everything. But what we depend on is healthy ecosystems. And an ecosystem is made up of the different plant and animal species that uh, that is the biodiversity of that particular habitat. And I think of the forest uh, in Africa because I know it best. And in that forest, every little plant and animal has a role to play, every species. And if you see it as like a great tapestry of life, then every time a species disappears from that tapestry, it's like a thread pulled out. And if enough threads are pulled out, then that tapestry will hang in tatters and the ecosystem may well collapse. And as I say, it's healthy ecosystems that we depend on. So if we continue destroying the environment at the rate that we have been, as many different ecosystems as we are impacting, the future looks very grim. And that's why protecting biodiversity is so very important. Well, I think, you know, for us doing the show, but I think for so many people, the interconnected nature, you know, our, our interconnected world has just been on full display during the pandemic. And also what we've seen just in the last couple of years alone, as a result of the climate crisis, seeing the damage to ecosystems, it's been impossible to avoid. So all of that in the last couple of years has been happening as we've had a two year delay for COP, and now this is the first COP being held in the UK. From our standpoint, there seems like there's a lot of attention on this year's COP, and there's a lot of, you know, certainly a lot of public pressure 
on world leaders. How crucial do you think the decisions that could happen this year will be and in, in, in how we decide to act on whether we're going to save some of the, net, you know, that biodiversity and improve our ecosystems? Well, the answer is that we have to somehow protect these ecosystems or we're doomed. You know, we're part of it. And it's, I think, become increasingly, the, the general public has become increasingly aware, partly as a result of the pandemic, of what we're doing to the planet, of the fact that we need a new relationship with the natural world, that we must admit that the planet does have finite natural resources. And in some places, we're using them up faster than nature can replenish them. And in addition to that, we've got three main problems to solve. And the first one is the unsustainable lifestyle of the elite or the affluent communities around the world. And we can probably include many government leaders and certainly business leaders in that category. Then we have to alleviate poverty because if you're, well, no, I should, I should add that these, these um, affluent people are placing unrealistic demands on the natural resources of the planet. They want more and more. They want far more than they need. Sometimes they, they're getting far more than they want. But then on the other hand, we have to alleviate poverty because if you're really poor and say you're an African community, you're going to cut down the last tree in your desperate effort to grow more food to feed your growing family because your own land is overused and infertile or you want to make money from charcoal or selling timber and if you're in an urban area you're going to buy the cheapest food you can't afford to ask as we can did it harm the environment in its production was it cruel to animals as in intensive farming is it cheap because of unfair wages or forced labor uh, they just have to buy the cheapest in order to survive and i mentioned there people struggling to feed their growing families. That's the other problem. Um, I have no idea how to solve it, uh, but the human population is now over seven and a half um, billion people. And already, as I say, we're using up natural resources, some places faster than nature can restore them. And by 2050, it's predicted it will be closer to 10 billion of us. So if we carry on with business as usual, what's going to happen? And it's something which it's not politically correct to talk about. But we have to face facts. What I've just stated is fact. And we need to talk about it and not hide it away under the carpet because it's politically incorrect or may upset some people. Well, you know, you've been, as you as you mentioned, you've been out talking about climate change, and you're obviously you're internationally renowned for your work and studying primates and anthropology. As a scientist, when did climate change become something that you really started to worry about? Oh, gosh, quite some time ago. <clears throat> you know, some climate scientists have been talking about it for quite a long time. I would say at least at least 20 years ago, I've been talking about it. Well, your career really changed from one of being a researcher and a scientist to one of uh, as an activist and a conservationist. What first caused this change in your focus? Well, to start off with, when I was young, I never dreamed of being a scientist because girls weren't scientists back then. Um, I'm speaking to you from the house where I grew up, actually. So the books I had as a child are all behind me. I wanted to be a naturalist. And when I had the opportunity of going to study chimpanzees, I hadn't even been to college. And it was Lewis Leakey who said I had to get a degree so that other scientists would uh, listen to what I was saying about chimp behavior. And so I got the PhD in the end, although I was criticized for doing everything wrong. You know, I shouldn't give chimps names, they should have numbers. I couldn't talk about their personality, their mind or their emotions. Those were unique to us. I'd learned as a child from my dog that that was rubbish, it just wasn't true. And I think Leakey was right, he wanted someone with an unbiased mind. 
So I went back to Gombe and I could happily have stayed there all my life. But in 1986, I helped put together a conference where we brought the people studying chimps from different parts of Africa. First, it was just me. By 86, I think there were six other study sites. And we had one session on conservation. It was just a total shock. I mean, everywhere, habitats were, forests were disappearing, chimp numbers were dropping. And we had a session on conditions in some captive situations like medical research labs, our closest relatives in five foot by five foot cages um, for life. So I went to that conference. I was a scientist by then. I had my PhD. I didn't even make a decision to change. It just was something that happened. I left as a, an activist, I suppose, or an advocate, whatever. <clears throat> and what are some of the biggest conservation successes that you've witnessed throughout your career? Well, I would say one is the growing awareness of the importance of conservation. And of course, David Attenborough has played a huge role in that with his with his many, many documentaries. Uh, then I think the fact that there are many, many more national parks and reserves now than there were when I started. Um, areas that have been totally destroyed by us, given a chance, have come back and once again support um, biodiversity. And finally, animals that have been on the very brink of extinction have been given another chance. I mean, I've got so many examples of that. We don't have time to go into them, but uh, I wrote a whole book about it. It's very exciting. Well, yeah, and you just recently published a new book, The Book of Hope, A Survival Guide for Trying Times. So what gives you hope that humans will step up to the challenge and address climate change with the scale and speed necessary? Well, <clears throat> hope is all about action as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's like we're in a very dark tunnel right now. We, we really are. And right at the end of that tunnel is a little star of light. That's hope. But to get there, we've got to climb over, crawl under, work our way around all these obstacles. And if we don't act now, because time's running out, then it may well be too late. But the, the reason I have hope that we're going to somehow manage it is... First of all, our intellect, the development of this separates us more from other animals than anything else. And scientists are beginning to come up with ways that we can live in greater harmony with nature, you know, renewable energy and that sort of thing. And then people as individuals are beginning to think about their own environmental footprint each day. And that adds up cumulatively to big change if enough people take those actions. And then next comes a very important reason for hope, and that's the energy commitment and determination of young people once they know the problems and we listen to their voices and we empower them to take action. And that's our Roots and Shoots program and other programs like it. And the main message, every individual makes a difference every day. Every individual matters. Every individual has a role to play. And the Roots and Shoots groups work out what they can do for, to help people, what they can do to help animals, what they can do to help the environment. But they get to choose. We don't dictate to them. So it'll vary depending on the environment, the age, kindergarten, university, everything in between, uh, the economic, socioeconomic uh, status, and so on. And they, they are changing the world. They literally are changing the world. And then finally, there's what I call the indomitable spirit, the people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up and so often succeed. And if they don't, they inspire others to carry on after them. Well, you've seen environmental activi activism up close for 35 years. What do you think makes today's youth climate activists different from environmental activists of the past? 
Well, when I was growing up, there was no really much environmental activism because we hadn't reached the stage when people talked about it. The word environment wasn't in the vocabulary when I was growing up. Today, uh, children mostly can't escape it. Certainly, if there's any, you know, if they have access to any kind of social media, radio, print or whatever, it's everywhere. And so the young people of today are worried, shocked, a lot of them deeply depressed, but mostly they can't escape understanding that there's a need for action. So many of them and older people feel helpless and hopeless because they don't know what to do. And so they fall back and do nothing. And therefore the depression gets worse, or the anger gets worse. And the only cure is to do something that makes a difference. If you think globally, you're depressed, you can't help it. Do, so <clears throat> do something locally, see that you make a difference, persuade your friends to join you. And uh, that gives you more hope, then you take more action, then you inspire more people. It's an upward cycle. Well, I can remember watching videos of you when I was a kid, and I remember how much it inspired me to want to learn more about nature and, and conservation. And, and I've heard youth activists like Vanessa Nakate and others say that your work inspired them to do more. So how does it make you feel knowing that you've inspired so many of the people who are right now on the front lines fighting for a better world? Well, it makes me feel um, it, it's all to do with the kind of life I've led, which was, a, it, it was just an amazing life. I mean, I started off, I had a really supportive mother. I've met so many people along the way who've helped and supported, either financially or with, with wisdom and advice. I've met these incredible people doing amazing things. So I've been really, really lucky. And the fact that my lucky life has inspired other people to to the children especially to try and emulate what needs to be done well that's very it's gratifying it's some people would say humbling but i'm not sure i think that word is sometimes used wrongly it's just poured out i feel humble i don't know that it's humble it's luck i feel lucky i feel blessed and i feel doubly blessed now with the world in crisis that my blessed life has led to other people wanting to do their bit too. Well, you've done so much already in your career, but how, how do we do more? How do we raise greater public awareness to the current threats to the natural world? Well, I don't think I can personally do more than I'm doing. I was traveling 300 days a year around the world. Of course, it wasn't very environmentally good, but our youth program has planted so many millions of trees that I don't feel too bad about that. Um, although virtually it's working pretty well now, I have to say, better than I thought it would. But anyway, um, I was giving lectures, I was talking to CEOs, I was talking to people in government, I was inspiring youth. But the way, the way to really get people involved is through telling stories. There's a lot of wonderful things going on and we need to share those stories because so often the media is just doom and gloom and then that makes people give up. They shrink away. They don't know what to do. But if we spend more time sharing those good positive stories, then more people will take action and more people will realize it's not too late, but the window's closing. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, during the pandemic, that hope and optimism that you talked about was more difficult because I think in a lot of the more traditional ways environmental and climate activists do their work, a lot of times it's out, it's out in public, it's in large events, and obviously a lot of that was shut down. How was the pandemic, you know, as you mentioned, you, you were traveling a great deal before the pandemic. How has the pandemic kind of changed your life and, and what can other environmental activists learn from that? Well, first of all, I was frustrated and angry because I had to cancel all these speaking engagements and I felt I was letting people down. Um, of course, in the venues closed down too, so it wasn't much I could do about it. 
And I thought, well, feeling frustrated and angry isn't helping anything. So with a little team from the Jane Goodall Institute, we created Virtual Jane. And I have to say that sitting where you see me now, in this room in my family home, I am more exhausted at the end of each day than I've ever been in my life before. Traveling 300 days a year was a piece of cake compared to sitting, looking at a screen, speaking to that little green dot at the top of the, the uh, laptop, or having, I've got a wonderful IT man, and he sometimes comes and helps to do a different kind of filming for interviews. But although it's not the same, I the hardest thing is giving a lecture uh, when you don't get any audience feedback. It's as though you're talking to yourself, but if you don't get the same energy and enthusiasm into what you're saying, then you might as well not say it. And again, it was my mother, if you're going to do a thing, do it properly. So, okay, overcame that hurdle. And the positive side of it is that with one talk, you can reach maybe five times more people. I mean, I was speaking to audiences of 10,000 in the US, but um, not always, sometimes. But, you know, with, with Zoom and with the internet and with all this amazing technology, people are coming into a lecture from all over the world. And in one day sitting here, I can be in five different countries in one day, but it's exhausting. It, it really is. Well, I feel like, you know, we, we changed the, the way we did the show during the pandemic. And we, we've learned so much from the pandemic. And what we were talking about with the damage we've done to our natural ecosystems. It, it's certainly something that we, we understand. But when you see something like a pandemic, when you see all that has unfolded, even in, in, in recent years al alone, you can understand the kind of harm that's being done. And I'm just curious, what do you hope that the general public, uh, hopefully we come out of this pandemic, what should the general public have learned during this COVID-19 pandemic that can help improve our, actually improve our lives in the future? Well, I think, I hope the general public will have learned uh, that we need to be more respectful of the natural world because we brought this pandemic on ourselves by our absolute disrespect of nature and of animals. So we go deep into animal habitats. Uh, we hunt them, kill them, eat them, capture them alive, traffic them or their body parts around the world to sell in unhygienic wildlife markets. And all of this creates opportunities for pathogens such as this virus to jump from an animal to a person where it may create a new zoonotic disease. And the same sort of thing with our factory farms where billions of animals, billions of animals are confined in the most horrendous conditions. And look, they're all producing methane in their digestion, terribly bad greenhouse gas, masses of CO2 produced from the fossil fuel burned um, to get the grain to the animals, the animals to the abattoir and the meat to the table. Huge areas of habitat destroyed to grow the grain, to feed the animals. And so, you know, in all of these ways, we've not only brought the pandemic on ourselves, but more people are realizing it's the same sort of thing that's led to climate change and loss of biodiversity. Yeah, and as the effects of climate change are manifesting across the world as, you know, as longer droughts, horrific wildfires, these deadly floods, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. So do you ever experience a sense of grief for what we're losing? Well, I, I, of course, I feel a sense of grief when I hear the last of something has gone or the last bit of habitat is destroyed. In my case, that leads to a sort of internal determination to, to save what's left, because we still live in a very, very beautiful world. There are still so many mysteries to try to solve. There's so much animal behavior. I mean, now scientists have finally admitted that animals have intelligence. The doors opening wide for young people today to study 
and learn about animal in intellect is, is amazing. You know, my octopus teacher, the intelligence of the octopus, and so on. So, yes, I get I get depressed when I see the terrible things happening, but it makes me even more determined to fight and get more and more and more people working to save what we have left. What do you think people need to understand about the extinction of species? I think they need to understand that, as I said earlier, the species become extinct and it's pulling threads out of this glorious tapestry that we still have left. And we've got to preserve that tapestry because if we allow ecosystems to collapse and they are dependent on the biodiversity, then that's that's harming our future totally so and when people say oh but you know we can we can bring back extinct animals now through through genetic manipulation people spending fortunes on trying to bring back the woolly mammoth to bring back an ice age creature into a warming planet a it's a horrible waste of money and the poor creature that comes back i mean that's an example of intellect gone wrong, according to me anyway. Well, as you look back on your time observing chimpanzees up close, how did that experience shape the way that you look at the world today? Um, I, don't, I don't think it did. I mean, I grew up loving animals out here in the garden. Um, there's trees and squirrels and birds, and I was watching them all the time on the cliffs above the above the um, sea there. Uh, I could wander about on the slopes. And so the chimpanzees, well, yes, they're different. They're close, closer related to us, our closest living relatives. But the one thing it did teach me, they're so like us. I mean, we share 98.7% of our DNA with them and postures, gestures of communication kissing, embracing, holding hands, swaggering, you know, so like us in so many ways. And yet we're different. I mean, uh, they're highly intelligent. They can learn five or 600 of the signs used by deaf people. They can work out computer problems, but uh, their intellect, amazing though it may be, as, a, is, as is that of other animals, doesn't compare to the creature that designed a rocket that went up to Mars, from which a little robot crawled taking photographs of the surface of Mars. So I think if we've seen those photos, we don't want to go and live there. I mean, at one time it was thought maybe Mars could support life as we know it, but I don't think anybody thinks that now. We've only got this one planet. So here's the bizarre thing. The most intellectual creature who's ever walked this earth is destroying its only home. And it seems to me there's a disconnect between the head and the heart. Was there anything about your time, you know, with the chimpanzees or you know, just li living in the, in the Gambi forest that gives you hope for the future? Yes, I think so. Um, when I arrived in 1960, Gombe was part of the great equatorial forest belt that stretched across Africa. When I flew over in the late 80s in a little plane, I was shocked to see a tiny island of forest, the tiny Gombe National Park, surrounded by bare hills. More people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food elsewhere cutting down trees even on the steep slopes in order to survive, as I said earlier. And uh, so that's when the Jane Goodall Institute began our program, Take Care of Tokari, to improve the lives of the people living around. And because we have managed to do that with this very holistic program, which includes things like scholarships for girls, because as women's education improves, family size tends to drop and we provide family planning information well received because people know that a way out of poverty is good education. They can't afford to educate eight or 10 children. And now the women have a way of controlling 
when they have their children and how many they have. And at any rate, because the people have now been helped to find alternative ways of living without destroying the forest, like tree nurseries, buying a few chickens and so on, uh, the forests have come back. You won't, you won't fly over and see bare hills anymore. And as a result, the chimpanzees of Gombe were absolutely isolated. And at one time there were no more than a hundred and that's not enough for long-term viability. But because of Takari, the villagers are, are now our partners in conservation. They've set aside land so that we've made corridors and female chimpanzees have moved in from outside. That's, that's how it works with chimps. It's the female who moves from one community to the next, taking her different genes with her. You know, we, we had a conversation with an author on the show earlier this year about the history of conservation, the history of the conservation movement here in the United States, where, where we're recording from. And over and over again, the lesson was nothing was inevitable. None of the conservation efforts that succeeded, nor was any of the, the biodiversity or natural loss inevitable. It took people acting to make both of those things happen. When you think about the stakes like that, how do you think that should motivate more people to do their part? Well, that's what I'm always urging people to do, that even if it seems just little, every little bit helps. And I think the most important lesson for conservation is you can't do conservation by building a fence and shutting people out. You must work with local communities. And that's the same even even in the US, like, you know, the migration of the Sandhill Cranes. I've been going there many springs to Nebraska and they're the farmers, poor farmers, you know, they were cutting down the hedges between the fields. And so they were desperate because they weren't earning enough money from their corn. So working with them, talking to them, saying, what about ecotourism? Maybe that can help, that sort of thing. And so a lot of that land is now, they, they let it grow back. And that amazing migration still happens year after year, 12 million water birds coming through, feasting on the grain, which is no longer buried back into the ground to enrich the soil. So, you know, there's so much hope out there. But I think, you know, one of the hallmarks of your career has, the, has been the way you use empathy. I mean, you were talking about earlier in the conversation, you, you took that unconventional approach of naming chimpanzees that you observed. This was not, uh, this is not used in, the, in the, the greater scientific community, but it clearly showed the sense of empathy that you have. And I think, you know, do you think this level of empathy by humans, not only toward other humans, but also to the uh, other animals and natural world. Do you think that's possible to scale? I think it's happening. I'm pretty sure with our Roots and Shoots group, where a project to help animals is part of the what they're required to do. And all do it, but just near, jolly nearly all of them. And I'm really proud, my granddaughter in Tanzania is now working, she's going around all the different regions of Roots and Shoots to talk about projects they can do to help animals. And this builds up empathy. So as Roots and Shoots is now in 65 countries and involving hundreds and thousands of young people, plus all those who've been through, I call them the alumni who take their values with them. You know, just with our little organization alone, we're spreading this empathy, which is so important because conservationists tend to talk about um, protection of a species. I like to talk about protection of individuals within the species because every individual animal matters just as every individual human does. And that's a message that's being heard loud and clear. There are more and more scientists talking about this different approach, this more humanistic approach, which em employs empathy. 
What made you such an empathetic person? I don't know. I mean, how can I answer that? I was just born that way, like I was born loving animals and having, I was lucky and having a wonderful family. I suppose you can teach empathy. Uh, I think our, our kids learn empathy for animals because they get to understand the animal. And some of them in inner city, I mean, there was, there was one little boy, he was, he was being in a remand school and it was a place where they let children be in contact with animals. And this little boy of 12 was led up. He just arrived and I happened to be there. It was a big old female rabbit and she'd been there for ages. She was used to all this. So they led him up to this rabbit and he looked at it and they picked up his hand and made him touch. And he had tears in his eyes. But you know what he said at the beginning when they said to him, would you like to meet this rabbit? He said, what's a rabbit? Education is very, very important. Well, as you mentioned earlier, that education, it, it can come from great storytelling. Obviously, with, with the new book and a lot of the work that you're doing now, what are the stories that you're hoping to tell now? I mean, I, I have to go to my own experience of stories, I think. And one story, which is very symbolic for Roots and Shoots, was the first group of children they were 12 to 14 roughly in the democratic republic of congo where we have an office and this first group had seen in a in a in a book that that hill over there they told their mentor uh, that used to be a sacred hill and it was covered with trees we want to put the trees back well there were only 15 of them and it's rather a big hill although it didn't look it when the children looked over the distance anyway he didn't want to dampen them. So this is the mineral rich area in um, Eastern Congo. And there's always a militia in, you know, they, they fight each other to get the minerals. So the leader of the group had to go to the Colonel, ask permission. He said, well, it's a stupid idea, but I suppose there's no harm in it, but I'll have to send soldiers with you. So he, their mentor got little saplings donated and this little procession of 12 children, 15 children, something like that, set off towards this hill, much further than they thought, very hot, very tiring. And with them, four big Congolese soldiers with AK-47s over their shoulders. So they get there and they start trying to plant their trees. And the youngest little girl, she began to cry because the ground was hard and she couldn't make the hole. And after about 10 minutes, one of the soldiers leaned his gun against a tree and went to help her. Within the next 10 minutes, all four soldiers were helping the children plant trees. And to me, that is just really, really symbolic. Well, as we mentioned earlier, you're a COP26 advocate for the upcoming event. What are you hoping to, to say or, or do at, at this upcoming COP26 event? Oh, well, I've been asked to give little keynotes, mini keynotes, I would say, to so many of the side events. And, you know, so what I what I do and say depends on the particular situation. Sometimes it's a little talk on climate change. Sometimes it's about biodiversity. Sometimes it's about experience in the corporate world, what it takes to to change a corporation so that it becomes more sustainable. Well, Dr. Goodall, you have been such an inspiration to Ty and I, and we're so happy, such an honor to have you on this show. Again, Dr. Goodall is the, the author of the new book, The Book of Hope, A Survival Guide for Trying Times, and will be a, a COP26 advocate at the conference coming up in Glasgow. Dr. Goodall, Thank you again for your time and for joining the Climate Pod. Well, thank you for inviting me to share some ideas. <laughs>